welcome to this session about deadlocks. Before I go on to the slides, I wanted to well, appear in full figure format and to give you an outline of what the session will be about. So I will first define what is a deadlock so we are on the same page in that regard. Then we will discuss how do we get information about the deadlock, how deadlocks, how do we get hold of the deadlock XML, because that is very important. Then I will go on to the analysis, that is, how do we read that deadlock XML? What are the important things we should look for? Now, once we know this, I will discuss various ways to prevent deadlocks from occurring. And often the decision you will make will be based on that analysis. But sometimes it's not possible to completely prevent deadlocks from occurring. But it there might still be measures we can take to mitigate the consequence of the deadlock, so it's not so much of a pain. So that is how the session will run. My name is Alan Somosko. I live in Stockholm, where I work as an independent consultant, and I've been an MVP for a SQL Server or Data Platform for, well, quite a few years by now. Now, if you want to get in touch with me, so here is my contact information. You reach me by um, sending email. Yes, yes, that's the way to do it sql at somersco.se. Also, very important, on our website you find slides and scripts for this session at somersco.se slash present. And I will also show you this information on the last slide of the session. So this was the introduction, and let's now move over to the slides. The first thing I'd like to discuss is what is a deadlock, because some people have a miscomprehension about this. We're going to move directly to Management Studio. And in this window, I'm going to move to the Northwind database, I will start a transaction, and I will update the freight of order 10,500, and I will leave that transaction open. Then I will move to a second window, and again, I'm going to move to Northwind, start a transaction, and update the ship address of order 11,000 to Mumbai. And again, I'm leaving the transaction open. Now I'm moving on, I'm making one more update. I'm updating the ship address to Accra for order 10,500. And you may recall that was the order I updated in the first window. And now this window is stored, it's not moving forward. And sometimes at this point, some people scream, oh, we have a deadlock. No, this is not a deadlock. If this window would now commit or roll back the transaction, the second window would also complete. However, that is not what I'm going to do. I will change the freight to one more order, and that's order 11,000, which you might recall is the first order I updated in the second window. And now both windows are stored, blocking each other, but all of a sudden we got an error message here in the first window. Message 1205 saying transaction process ID 51 was deadlocked with locked resources with another process that has been chosen as the deadlock victim rerun the transaction. So this is a condition when you have this situation, two processes of locking each other, two or more, a SQL Server will check for this and resolve this situation. And if I now in this window try to roll back the transaction, oops, sorry. If I try to do this, I get an error because the transaction has already been rolled back. Whereas the second window, it completed successfully. And if I wanted to, I could commit that transaction, but I'm gonna roll it back so I can reuse the demo later on. So, to summarize, a deadlock is when you have two, more, two or more processes blocking each other in such a way that none of them can continue. And as server checks for this condition by default every five seconds. But if there are plenty of deadlocks, it might increase that frequency and checks for the deadlocks more often. Now, so what happens then if a deadlock is found, as server injects an error to one of the processes, it's that which is selects as the deadlock victim, and that will roll back the transaction for that process. Now, how does SQL Server select the data victim? Well, it looks at the amount of log records, and the one with the least amount of log records is being the deadlock victim, because that is assumed to be the, the cheapest one to roll back. Now, for the next questions, are deadlocks really a problem? Sometimes I'm, I see people in forum, oh, we have a deadlock, what do we do now? Yo. But wait a minute, wait a minute, deadlocks occur in the best of families, and it's perfectly normal for any system to have a deadlock every once in a while. It's absolutely no cause for alarm. But if you have plenty of deadlocks per day, yeah, then you might start to get some pain for it. For example, users, well, if they all, all every, every once in a while get splashed in the face, deadlock victim, they get kind of upset, and they might even get upset if you 
trap that message and replace it with something nicer, particularly if they have to redo the, the operations daily or more often than that. Also, if you have some, let's say, order enterprises or something like that, like a, so, something where it's be, and you've got plenty of deadlocks, but the, your throughput is, will, will be reduced because this is, everything is stored for a few seconds until the deadlock is resolved. So if deadlocks are a pain, yeah, then you need to try to prevent them. And the first thing to do that is to analyze them, and you need to get information about the deadlocks. And the easiest way to do that is to query the system hot session, which is an extended event session that collects various information, including deadlocks. And this uh, session ships with SQL Server, starting with SQL 2012, and it's always running unless you explicitly, explicitly turn it off, which you shouldn't do. And the way you query it is that you use this function, um, sysfnxe file target read file. And you give the name, the name of the file is always system health, but don't forget that asterisk because it's not a single file, but there are multiple files with rollover files with very, very long suffixes after system health. And if you don't put in that asterisk, you will not get any output, nor will you get an error. You will we just get an empty result set. And you also, there are also three more parameters, but you will always leave them out and just say default. And you need to filter the output for exactly the XML deadlock report event, because else you will get the other things that most of the time you're not interested in. Um, and this function returns an event data, which is nvarcal max. You need to cast it to XML so you can look at it. Now, as you might see here, I also return a timestamp and I order by the timestamp. However, that column is only available at SQL 2017 later, and I will show you in a second how you will deal with that on, early, uh, on um, earlier versions. So let's go into a demo, have a look at this function in the... Um, so here, this, is, this is exactly the query that I showed you. I'm going to run this, and you can see here I got back a couple of deadlocks events here. And let's have a look at one of these XMLs. And there is event data value tag. These come from extended events. That is how the the event is packaged and the deadlock well that is the very event itself and if there is a inside that this it there is a victim list there's a process list and there is a resource list and we're going to look at these in a lot more detail later on now that's one thing about management studio i'd like to show you so you might notice here this process there's a lot of attributes and you might notice this glyphs here this is not the default behavior but what i have done in management studio is i've gone into tools options and then text editor XML. And here I've checked. Oh, wait a minute. Sorry, that was the wrong one. Here's one for XML. Uh, word wrap show visuals glyphs for word wrap. Um, this makes it a lot easier to write, uh, read XML, not only for deadlock XML, because you don't have to scroll sideways like a maniac with this setting. Now, um, in this file, I've got a few more queries. Can look at so this query here is almost the same as the previous one, but what it does is that it shaves off these um, event data value tags that comes from extended events, so it's slightly prettier output. Here you can see that now the, the deadlock tag is the outermost, but else it's the same information. Um, now, as I mentioned on SQL 2016 and earlier, you don't have the timestamp UTC column. However, the timestamp is available inside the event data XML. So we can extract it and then sort it by this way. And this is possibly somewhat slow. I haven't really tested that, but it could be. But you can see, again, I get the same output. Now, the system health session has two so-called targets. One is the file. The other one is ring buffer that is only in memory. And this query goes against the ring buffer. It's a little more complicated. I will not discuss it in, uh, describe it in detail. So but I'm going to run it. And you may see here that I only get one event. This is because I only have the events now that since SQL Server started. And if there's been a lot of things going on in system health, even those deadlocks might have fallen out when I come around to look at it. So as you might guess, the ring buffer is less useful. However, if you are an Azure managed instance, this is your only option for system health. Because on an managed instance, you don't have access to the file system and therefore you don't have access to the, the file target. Um, and speaking of Azure Managed Instance, there's also Azure SQL the database. Now, on Azure SQL database, you don't have access to system health at all. However, the service comes with a custom or a customized extended events session 
only for deadlocks called DL, and to query to use the function fnxc telemetry blob target read file and do it like this. And beware here now, you need to run this in the master database of your sure server, not in the database where the deadlock occurred. You must run it in the master database. But most likely you want to filter it for the database. I couldn't fit fit that filter on the slide. However, in this script file that I showed you includes an example where I filter for the database. Now, you may also prefer to define your own extended event session for one reason or another. And the event you would use is the XML deadlock report event. There is also a database XML deadlock report, which doesn't give, it's almost the same, but it has a few more values which are not particular, particular interest. Now, so why would you do this? Well, particularly if you are in a show managed instance, and you don't want to rely on the ring buffer, you can do this and then you would write to, to blob storage to get the, that, that, would, that, would, that would be your option. Uh, but it can also be that you find on your system that querying the system health session is quite slow because, well, for one reason or another, I found this on an occasional system that it was quite slow. On other systems, no problem at all querying it for deadlocks. It can also be that you want low latency, not so much in production. The default uh, uh, latency for system health is two minutes, which is probably okay for production because you probably don't look, look at the deadlock directly. But if you're doing some labs, you're testing, playing around, then you might want short latencies so you don't have to wait. Now, if you, would, if you have your own extended event session, you would query in the same way as system health. And don't forget that asterisk and see that script file for an example of how to do this. Now, there are a few more ways to get information about deadlocks. You can turn on trace flag 1222 and you would get the deadlock XML in the SQL Server error log, except that you will not get the angle brackets of the XML. And this is kind of a low tech, simple method that some people may prefer. Other people say that, no, no, this lit is the error log, don't do that. And overall, I would say the information is a little more difficult to read because you also have the, the standard stuff in the SQL Server error log. Uh, then we have trace on profiler. And I would say this is mainly an option on SQL 2005 or 2008, where you don't have um, extended events, because the great thing with extended events is that you can define an extended events session to always start when SQL Server starts. To do this with trace, yeah, you can do it with some trickery, startup procedures, etc. So it's easier to do that with extended events now. Now, there's one thing I like to call out, and that if you do this in profile, you might see this graph that looks quite pretty. You might think, oh, I can understand how this deadlock... No, no. At least I am not able to understand what they're trying to convey with this graph. And also, there's some quite important information missing from this XML. Oh, sorry, from this graph. So just give this one a blind eye. If you're working with Trace or Profiler, you have the, the XML in the text data column. Just copy and paste it into an editor to have a look at the raw XML. Now, let's go in and look what is inside that deadlock XML. I've already shown you that there is a victim list, which has the uh, the deadlock victim. There is a process list which lists all the processes involved in the deadlock and there is a resource list which lists the locks or the resources they are fighting about. Now let's start with the process list and inside the process list there are at least two process tags because just like it takes two to tango, it takes at least two to a deadlock. And there are lots of attributes that I have just short, abbreviated or shortened out here. And there's also nested two other tags, execution stack and input buff that gives you information about the current statement. And let's start to look at these. Now, so here is a simple case. This is exactly the deadlock we had in the beginning. So I have an ad hoc statement and I see exactly in the input buff, which was the statement in the deadlock. Now it could be a multi-statement batch and then you would have, you may not see the exact statement then in the execution stack, but you could look at the line numbers to figure out which is the statement where the deadlock occurred. Now, but you may also be looking at this, it just says proc, database ID, and object ID with a number. Now, this is most likely what you, you will see in case of a stop procedure. It's being called from, or, or an application that calls a stop procedure. It's now being called through a remote procedure call. So now you might wonder, what do I do with this? Well, you have to go to the execution stack tag for more information. And here is an example. So you, do, you, you need to read this from the bottom and up. So in this case, the application called ultra SP, which is in its turn then called inner SP, and then here we have the deadlock statement. It's quite easy to tell because most of the time all the other lower statements will be exec unless there's a trigger involved. Um, now one thing you may note here is that these statements seem to be chopped off, and indeed they are, uh, but that's a bug that was introduced I think in SQL 2014, but it's only the last character that has been lost. 
kind of irritating, but I haven't come around to file a bug for it yet. Um, then we have all the process attributes, and that's a frightening lot, and you might feel that your head starts spinning a little bit when you see this, but I found that not all of these are really interesting in, in, in the proceedings. So this is what it's stripped down. So this is a stripped down version of the attributes that I find interesting. And then in, in the coming slides, I will go through these in more details. So I will start with the simple ones, the process identification. So first of all, the ID, that attribute doesn't, as far as I can tell, I've not been able to get uh, some use for this one outside the, uh, the, pro, the deadlock XML. Maybe there is, but I haven't just found the use for it. However, it is serves as a mapping between process list, resource list, and the victim list, particularly the, the first two. Then we have the SPID. Well, that's all the, the session ID we all know a love. Then we have SPID for uh, server batch ID, which will be non-zero if you have multiple active res resources or masks in use. And it will also be non-zero if the query comes is an incoming query on a linked server from another SQL Server instance. Then we have ECID, Execution Context ID, which will be non-zero for a parallel plan. And because when you have a parallel plan, or there is a parallelism, that will be many process tags for the same speed, one for each thread involved in the deadlock. Then we have current DB name, login name, client app, and host name. Don't need any further explanation. Although, keep in mind with the last two that they are set in the connection string and might not be entirely accurate. Then let's move on to the transaction name attribute. This is an extremely important one because it answered this very, very, very important question. Is the deadlock occurring in the multi statement transaction or not? Because if you are in a multi statement transaction, you cannot only look at the statement in the deadlock. You will need to look at the rest of the code of the store procedure of the transaction because the logs involved in the deadlock might have been taken earlier inside the transaction. Now, if the transaction name reads, well, let's say user transaction, well, then you have a multi statement transaction, obviously. But it can also read, well, my tran, Gretchen, or New York, or well, whatever, because someone named the transaction and said, begin transaction my tran. Then you might see also implicit transaction. That is also a multi statement transaction. This occurs when the setting set implicit transactions is in effect. Uh, this setting is not very widely often used in SQL Server, although it's the ANSI standard, but there are some API that turns this one on under the cover. So you, you could run into this. However, if transaction name reads, well, select, insert, update, delete, etc., well, then much likely it's, it is an auto committed statement, a single statement transaction. Although, it could check the execution stack because it could be in, inside the trigger. So let's say that you have an insert statement that fires a trigger and the deadlock occurs inside the trigger. Transaction name will read insert, but it's still a multi statement transaction because of that trigger executes in the context of that insert statement. And finally, it can also, transaction name can read insert exec because, well, you use insert exec statement and the supersedure in that case will execute in the context of. A transaction in the context of the transaction defined by that insert statement. So again, you have a multi statement transaction. Now, there are also three timestamps last trans started, last batch started, and last batch completed. You also should have a look at that. They're also very important. As last trans started, is that one before last batch started? In the very most cases, this means that you have a multi batch transa transaction started by the application. So the application starts the transaction and then makes multiple calls. Although occasionally it could be a token of a runaway transaction, that is, there was a call to the procedure that started a transaction, but for some reason neither commit nor rollback was executed. So you have a runaway transaction. But that's a less common case. Now, then look at last batch. If you have a multi batch transaction, look at last batch completed and last batch started. Um, are they far apart? If you don't have a multi batch transaction, they can be hours apart, no problem. But if last trans started, it's before last batch started and last batch completed, and these are like, let's say, two seconds apart or five seconds apart. That's kind of weird because then application is doing a lot of things between the calls. That's worth investigating because that is making the, um, the transaction longer and the window for the deadlock wider. That's absolutely something to look into. Now, there's one more timestamp, and that is last attention. Most of the time it will read 1st of January 1900. But it could be something else, and if it's later than last trans started, that's a red flag. You have a runaway transaction. 
Most likely what has happened in this case is that the application has experienced the error timeout expired and without rolling back any transaction. So by default, most client APIs, they will give up after 30 seconds if SQL Server hasn't completed and say, no, no, I'm not, I don't want to know about wait anymore and send SQL Server an attention signal. Now SQL Server will roll back the current statement and then stop executing. But any transaction will not be rolled back on unless the setting X board is on, and it will not be rolled back. It doesn't matter even if the transaction was started in the same batch or if it was started before. The transaction will be left open. And the application must, in this case, react by rolling back, check if there is an open transaction, and then roll back. So if you see this, we just stop analyzing the rest of the deadlock. You have found the problem. You have to go review the error handling code in the application, because if you have a runaway transaction, that can lead to excessive blocking and deadlocks, absolutely. Then we have the transaction count, or trend count attribute. That sounds like kind of interesting, and it, yes, it is, but it's also a little bit deceivable. Because you see, if you have an, a single insert, update, delete, or merge statement, well, trend count will at least be two. It will never be one or zero. And it will be two no matter if it's a, um, it is a single statement transaction or a multi statement transaction. Only if you have a nested transaction, it will be three or higher. That is, you have a stop procedure that starts, we say, begin transaction, calls another procedure that also does, does begin transaction, presumably because that inner procedure is intended also to be called on its own. So most of the time, it doesn't tell you that much. However, if you have a very high value, that could indicate a runaway transaction. And high value is, well, it doesn't really match the stack depth. So let's say you see a trying count of six, but there are 10 procedures on the call stack, well, that's probably okay. But if there is only two, that doesn't really match up because you should have really been able to reach that. So that could be worth investigating. The last attribute we're going to look at is the isolation level attribute. In most cases, you will see read committed here, but, and with that isolation level, share locks are released when they are not needed anymore. So, and that could even be before the statement. But if you see repeatable read or serializable, this means that share logs are being held to the end of the transaction. Now, that may be perfectly good cases where you have this isolation level. It does mean the logs are being held longer and higher risk for deadlock. But there might be semantics in the application that you need this unless, or else you could get data errors. However, there are some APIs that turn on serializable by default under the covers. So you should ask yourself, do we really need this isolation level? It could be just beyond by chance, but you might need it. Um, and also keep in mind, so even if you see read committed, you could still have share locks being held to the end of the transaction because maybe someone changed the isolation level during the course of the transaction, or it was set explicitly for by hints in some queries. Now let's move on to the resource list element. And here is an overview of it. So in this case, we can see there is a, well, there's one element per for each lock in the deadlock that is involved. But the name of that element will depend on the type of lock, and I will discuss that just in a few slides. And inside that, we have two lists, nest, a nested into that, an owner list, which lists the owners, that is the processes, processes that are holding the lock, and the waiter list, the waiters that are pro processes, the processes that are waiting to get the lock. So here's an inflated example. Of this, so you can see here, I got a key lock, skipping the attributes for right now. I got an own list on this process, C8. I tend to only look at the last two hex digits if possible, or if, if it's, as long as it's unique, to, because the first pass always seems to be 26 EAB, as you can see here. Anyway, I got an exclusive lock here, whereas the waiter is waiting to get a share lock, and you can see request types read wait. It can sometimes read convert if you have a if the process has a share lock, I want to convert that to an exclusive lock, but it doesn't really matter. It's always a request, uh, overweighting. That's the important thing. And down here in this lock, the process E8 holds, holds a share lock, whereas the C8 is now waiting to get an exclusive lock, and therefore they are deadlocking. And keep in mind, keep in mind that these ID they go back to the process elements so you can see what these processes are doing. Now, this is this XXX lock element. As an, a couple of attributes, and the most important ones are the name of the table and the name of the index where the lock, the lock was taken. Then there are a couple of ones. Uh, so as I said, there's key lock, which is the most common one. That is a row lock. 
in an index, that could be a clustered index or a non-clustered index. It will always read key lock, never exactly road lock. You may also see red lock. That is also a road lock, but that occurs if you have a heap, that is a table without a clustered index, when you go and access the data page. It can also read page lock. Well, that is a lock on page level. And object lock, that is a lock on table level. There are a few more possibilities, for example, metadata lock and the more esoteric deadlocks that I will not cover here. Um, I said that you do not have to look at the other ones, but in page locks, though, the index name is missing. So you can take the associated word object ID and look it up the index name with the query. And yes, you often need to know the name of the index to understand the deadlock. So you're joining sys partitions with the sys indexes, and you have the object ID is the associated object ID, and eventually you get back the index name. Now, before I leave the resources, I'd like to discuss deadlocks with parallelism in a little more detail. So, if you have a query with a parallel plan, you will get one process per thread involved in the deadlock. They will all have the same speed, but different ECE ID. Uh, and in the resource list, you're likely to see exchange event elements because the threads are waiting for each other. So let's say this, thread one is trying to read a row, but it's blocked by a writer that has already updated that row. And then uh, process thread, or thread five is reading a row, and by that meaning, it's blocking the writer in some way or another. So you have a dialogue between these. And then two process, uh, sorry, threads two, three, and four, threads two, three, and four, they are just waiting for the other ones, and they get also listed in the deadlock, but really, oops, sorry about that, just ignore these and focus on the locks instead, because the exchange events doesn't really tell you that much. It's the locks you wanted to troubleshoot. Now, sometimes, a very odd situation, but you might have a situation where all processes in the process list all have the same spin. This is an intra-query deadlock. I don't think I've ever seen this myself. And I'm being told, that these are bugs in SQL Server. You can't really do anything with these except for turning off parallelism. So if you get run into this, first of all, apply the most recent cumulative update. And if the issue persists, open a case with Microsoft. Now let's talk about how to prevent deadlocks. And I've listed a couple of things here. Always access resources in the same order. Create tuning and indexing, read committed snapshot, lock-ins, review application behavior, and serialize with application locks. And on the coming slides, I will go through this in, the, in the more detail. So yes, always access resources in the same order. That's a standard recommendation. I remember you when well, reading this, it always comes first. Oh, I will always access resources in the same order. And if you remember that first deadlock, well, it was very simple. They were accessing the orders in, re in reverse order. Had they been accessing order, well, for example, all in, both in the well, order ID order, that would not have been a problem. But things can be a lot more difficult to implement in practice because maybe there is some very complicated business rules that says, okay, we're going to adjust the freights here, but we're going to look at the orders. Yeah, somehow look at this one, this one, this one, this one. And maybe the same thing for the ship address. It gets even more pronounced if you have multiple tables involved and you update first row in table A, B, and C for that one. And the business rules say, well, oh, we need to start in D and then go to A and so on. So this can be very, very difficult to implement in practice. Although, of course, there can be situations where a deadlock can be resolved by us changing the access order. And hey, not even SQL Server itself obeyed to this rule when it builds query plans. So let's have a look at this. We're going to open a look at the deadlock here, XML. So in this deadlock, we can see, first of all, there is a select. So this is a single statement transaction. And this select is computing the total freight for all orders for a certain employee ID. And the other process here is an update. Let's see where I do I have the mouse. And there is it. Yeah, so it's an sorry, that's it's an update. And there's nothing on the execution stack to tell us that it's a trigger. But so it's, it's exactly this statement. And what we're doing here is that we are changing the employee ID for a specific order. Now let's look at the locks. So the first lock is on the clustered index where the writer holds an exclusive lock and the reader is trying to get shared lock. And the other one is the index on employee ID. Here, the reader is the king holding a shared lock and the, the writer was trying to get an exclusive lock. So what is going on here? Well, so let's say that this query is runs for, um, the select runs for employee ID 42. And it just so happens that the employee ID of this order is 42. And now we're gonna change it to something else. 
So the writer comes in here by the class of index because it has the order ID and updates the data page, takes an exclusive log of that page. The reader, but then it has to go, and then it has to go and also update the, the index value in the non-clustered index. Whereas the reader comes uh, to run this query, it's going to seek this index on the employee ID, taking a share log, and then it has to go to the data page to read the freight. And that, but then it's going to be blocked by the writer. Because the accessing resource is in the same order, we get a deadlock. But just imagine if SQL Server would try to avoid this, what the query plans would look like. Probably the, the select query would have to be a scan and would be, would be a lot less efficient. No, we don't want that. Now, so let's talk about something which is a lot more fruitful to reduce and prevent deadlock, that is query tuning and indexing. So let's talk about page locks and table locks. So in the previous example, which we looked at, the process were fighting about the very same row. Now imagine instead that it had been page locks. And imagine also that the order, sorry, the employee on that order that the writer tried to change was 46. Now with row locks, that would not be a conflict because it's only locking rows. But when they are on the same page, well, then even if the rows are unrelated, you could get conflicts. So it's a lot more wider, even more so if you're on the, on the entire table. So the lower granularity will increase the risk for deadlocks when you have page and table locks. So if you can remove these locks, that helps to prevent the deadlocks. Although I'd like to remind you here that there is something called intent locks, that is IX, IS, AU, etc. They're always taken on table and page level, and that's just perfectly normal, because these, these locks mean, hey, I'm locking something down here. If a writer wants to take an exclusive lock on a row, it first has to take an intent lock on page level to block another reader from taking a shared lock on the entire table. And, and same thing for the page. So these are perfectly okay, but if you see S, X, and U, etc., if you see these locks on page and table level, you have something to, something to go after. And also, what I found is that these logs are often a token of a query that needs to. It could be perfectly normal. It might be an analytical query that actually has to scan the table from start to end. There is no, there is no, uh, nothing to, to change that. But most, very often, it could be a query that the indexing, indexing is not perfect, or there is something else. So let's see what we can do with this. So let's say that you are looking at a deadlock and you find this query, and there are page logs. Select staff from orders with data month. One order date is greater than get it. Now, if you know something about query tuning, you know that when you entangle a column in the expression, like we do here, we cannot, the optimizer cannot, it's not able to rewrite this. It, well, it should be, but it's a laser bump, so it doesn't do that. So it will not be an index seek. You can as best get an index scan to do this. And index scans often result in page stocks because Many rows to scan, SQL Server thinks, ah, let's preserve some memory and do take page logs. So if you see this in the deadlock, well, there is no read to analyze the rest of the deadlock, but just simply rewrite the query so that the, there can be an index seek. Now let's have a look at the deadlock with page logs. It's a little more complicated than the previous one, but it could still be worth in looking at. And it also illustrates parallelism. So here I've got a select query, and again, it's a single statement transaction. But look here, SPID60 and ECID1. So this is a running parallelism. And here I've got a table called Tool Orders. And again, I'm summing the freight, but this time for orders on a specific date. And then I've got a writer here. It's going to, it says Update, and there's no trigger on the stack. And what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm changing the shipper. I'm changing the shipper of this order. And then I've got the reader again. It's SPID60. But now this time it's ECID 3. And it goes on like this, or a few more ECID 4, and it's also going to the same statement. There are only two sessions involved in this deadline. Now let's look at the resource list. And we can find here, that first of all, there is a, um, well, it's a table of tool orders, and it's a page, and as I said, we don't see the name of the index. We would have, we would have to look that up. I'm going to tell you more about it later on the slides. But anyway, the reader, holds an intent exclusive lock of that page, and there's nothing wrong with that lock as such. But the writer, the, sorry, the reader has takes, trying to take a share lock on that page. On the other page, it's the other way around. The reader has a shared lock, whereas the writer is trying to get an intent exclusive lock. 
Now, to explain this log is a little more difficult, so I will do this on slides. So these were the statements. And there's one thing I need to tell you. There is no index with order date as the first column, but there is an index on ship via order date. So because there is no index to be seeked, Escozer will scan that index. And because there are many rows, Escozer will go for page logs. And furthermore, because there are 50 million rows, Escozer says, let's use parallelism, which means that multiple pages will be locked simultaneously by different threads. Now, looking at the writer, that writer needs to modify two pages in the index on ship buyer because it's going to move that row from one page to another page and needs to take, take intent locks on both these pages. And it's able, and it's able to lock the first page, but then when it tries to lock the next one, it's blocked by a reader thread. And in the meanwhile, also, a reader arrives and tries to read that first page and is being blocked, a reader row from that first page, but is blocked by the writer. And Boom, we have a deadlock. Now, how do we resolve this? Well, maybe we should add an index and order date so we can seek the index. And really, we could tell this from the start. We didn't really have to know this analysis. We could just see, okay, page logs, which index? Oh, the index and ship by one. What, why not the index and order date? Oh, there isn't any one. Okay. Now, sometimes you might be in the situation, this is not very common, but you could be in the situation Everything looks okay, there is an index, but for some reason that still only table logs or page logs, but there are no row logs. Now, to preserve your sanity, run this query. Very, very rarely this query returns into rows, and it shouldn't do. But if it does, this means that there are one or more indexes for which row logs and or page logs have been disabled. Which, why would you do this, you may ask? I don't know. But you, those options are available in SQL Server. And through the years when I've been helping people with, with deadlocks, I think I've seen this twice, several years apart, but it, it does occur every once in a while. Anyway, so if you get back in rows, enable page row logs with this statement. So and hopefully that, that resolves the problem. Now, you may be looking at your deadlock and thinking, oh, I only have row logs. Okay, I don't need to bother about query tuning. Up, 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 not that fast, not that fast. There could still be reasons to do this. Remember, this deadlock we looked at previously. Now, there's more than one way to skin this cat, but maybe the best solution here is to add freight as an included column in the index on employee aiding. If this is an important query, then we run off it. It might not be the best solution for other reasons, but it could be a possible solution. Now, there's another deadlock case that I'm not going to show you in XML. I'm only going to describe it because it's a multi-statement case. So we have process P and it starts a transaction and it updates it one or more rows in table T. And then for some reason, P goes and runs a query to populate the temp table, presumably using some of these updated rows. And that query runs for two minutes. In the meanwhile, process Q starts to select joining S and T and it starts with reading rows from S and then it needs to read rows in T, but Oh, it's being blocked by P because it updated those rows. And eventually P completes and tries to update a row in S that Q has locked. And boom, we have a deadlock. Now, so how do we deal with this deadlock? We don't know anything about the tables. We don't know anything about indexes. But uh, doesn't this point stand out like a sore thumb? I mean, what if we could tune that in search query so that it runs, at, let's say, 200 milliseconds? That would not entirely prevent the deadlock. It could still occur. But the window, instead of being this wide, the deadlock window is just this thin because it's drastically being reduced. And that's a very important observation. The shorter your transactions are, the less is the risk for deadlock. And I mean short, I mean, I mean in terms of time. Not that you should split up your transaction because if they need to be atomic, they need to be atomic and you must keep them that long. But if you can make them execute faster, that can also help to reduce the deadlock. Now, the last thing I like to discuss when it comes to indexing is that, as I said previously, well, maybe we can add an index to resolve the deadlock. But you may also have the situation that you have too many indexes, and that's why you get the deadlock. So first of all, keep in mind, if there are more indexes there are on the table, that means that insert, delete, and update, well, those statements take a longer time. And therefore, the deadlock window gets wider. But you can also keep in mind that two DML statements that run at the same time, they update the indexes in different order, and therefore they clash and deadlock. So I'd like to remind you that check and sysdmdb index usage stats for unused indexes. 
keeping in mind that this DMV is being cleared on server start, so be a little careful. Also check for redundant indexes. For example, let's say if there's both indexes on A and AB, well, most likely you can drop the first indexes. First index. And or you might have indexes on ABC include D and ABC include E. Well, consolidate that into one single index, most likely to be the correct solution. So this is all, uh, particularly if people using misusing the database uh, engine tuning advisor, you quite easily end up with this situation. Now let's move over to another big thing to remove deadlock, and that is a read committed snapshot. Let me tell you about the system I'm working with daily. So it had been live for about two months, and we came into a period where the users had to enter forecasts, and all of a sudden they entered data like crazy like this. And we got some really vile deadlocks, like could be 12 processes in the deadlock. And as conservatives would say, oh, deadlock, oh, that's the deadlock victim. And then five seconds, there will be another deadlock, now with 11 processes, and then five seconds later, 10 processes, and so on. Not very happy users, not a good situation to be in. But we resolve this very, very easily. We put the database into single user mode, and then we set all the database, set read commit a snapshot on, and then put back the database to multi user. And since then, well, we have deadlocks every once in a while, like once every second month or so, normally, not very often. So it's quite a drastic change, yes. Now, why is this? Well, because when you enable this, this means rather than reading from the rows directly and taking locks, the readers will read it from a version store, and that doesn't require locks, and they will get what was committed before any new transaction started. So basically, the reader will see the state of the database when the select statement started, more or less. Um, so this means that readers will not block writers and vice versa. Great way to remove all deadlocks that involves a reader and a writer. Almost, because this only applies to the default isolation level, read committed. So if you're using repeatable read or serializable, well, you will still take locks in the same goes if you use any of these hints to override read committed. But most of the deadlocks, including readers and writers, are being re removed. Although, while this is a great feature, there are some caveats you need to be aware of. First of all, yes, there is an overhead for maintaining this version store, and exactly how much that is, well, that depends on your workload. But it particularly update and delete operations that are, um, that are hit by this, not so much in search. And it also includes adding a 14 byte pointer to update the rows, and then they remove that pointer when you rebuild the index, so it can cause some page splits, unless you maybe have some lower fill factor so you can make room for these. Also, that version store is maintained in tempdb normally, which means that you have to increase the tempdb size and make sure that there is space for tempdb, and also again review the hardware for tempdb so it doesn't sit on any slow hardware. You really need, always need, always having fast hardware for tempdb is a great idea. Although, if you're using the feature accelerated database recovery for the database, the version store will be in the database itself. Now, those were the technical caveats. Then you need to ask yourself about the application. Because you are, in fact, reading stale data. The data is being processed or being updated. So what you're reading is old data. Now, then there's the question, does that matter to you or not? I can't answer that, but you need to, to answer this for yourself. But as in it, food for thought, food for thought, and some, some example here. So let's say this. We have these business rules. Um, we cannot have an, an inactive, inactivated securable in a portfolio. And we cannot inactivate a securable if it is at least one portfolio. And there are triggers to enforce this. Now, let's say this transaction A adds a securable to a portfolio, and at the same time, transaction B runs and it inactivates that very same securable. Um, and then the wall the triggers reads from the snapshot and finds all good. The good, boom, business rule violation, because we end up with something that shouldn't happen. Now, there is a workaround for this. You can apply the read committed lock hint to say, no, no, for this read, I want to have locks but you need to do it for every table because there is no set tra transaction isolation level command for this. And in case you wonder, a school server will always validate foreign keys by using locks. So I can't say whether this matters to you or not. Now for the system I talked about, it was a no brain. I just couldn't see any reason why this, we could have these issues. On the other hand, for many years, I worked with another system where we have plenty of business rules like this, lots of these triggers. And there's also a component of, please don't ask me about the details, but that component would be complete disaster with read committer snapshot because it would have been reading stale data. It was out of the question for that component. 
And if you get nervous now about read commit and snapshot, well, there is an alternative. You can say all the database set allow snapshot isolation on, and this does not require a single user mode. And in places where it's safe to read stale data, for example, report procedures, you say set transaction isolation level, isolation level read uh, snapshot. So now these processes, these procedures will read from the snapshot and there will be no locks. Now, there are three more points on this list, and I will be brief on these and only take one side on each. First, lock ins. That's, yeah, lock ins. That sounds something like great for deadlocks. And yes, there is the UPD lock in. That's a great hint to be, uh, prevent so called conversion deadlocks. So let's say this you have a procedure where you're going to read a row and you're going to update it later on. So you think this, okay, oh, I need to repeat will read, read or serializable here so that no one can go and update the row while I'm doing this. Now, let's say that for some reason, there's two instances uh, of this procedure running at the same time and working on the same row. So both of them are locking that row, and then they try to update and deadlock. Now, what you should do instead is to use the UPD lock hint rather than a repeatable read or serializable. Because then you say, I want an update lock. An update lock is a read lock, so it doesn't block plain readers, but it's a lock that can only be one UPD lock on the resource at the same time, because it's lock means that, hey, I plan to update this row later on. Then we have the row lock hint, and this sounds like, yeah, if you have page and table locks, oh, I'm gonna use row lock. And yes, 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 it could be a temporary measure, because to do that query tuning that we talked about, that could take some time, you might need to do some testing, etc., etc. So in the meanwhile, you can put in row lock to get rid of the deadlocks. But keep in mind, though, that this could be a, cause a lot worse pain, because there is a reason why SQL Server is taking page locks. So let's say that this is a very popular query. Lots of processes are running this one in parallel, and you plus so all of a sudden force row locks, and your server now starts to get more like this because of all the memory being taken. And then we have the no lock. In. Yes, no lock will absolutely prevent deadlocks, and it will take you out of the frying pan and into the fire because you will get a lot of nastier concurrency problems. Rather than getting errors, you will get incorrect results, and that's a lot, lot worse. And what is even worse is that sometimes people may not even notice that they get incorrect results, because they would be perfectly transient. It would be very, very difficult to troubleshoot. No, no log is not a solution for deadlocks. Review application behavior. This is a placeholder for all sorts of things. So one thing I discussed earlier is application running a multi-batch transaction and doing a lot of work between the batches. Maybe for every between the batches is going out to call a web service. Well, maybe we should redesign that so to call, make all these calls before starting the transaction, something like that. Or maybe as the application is looping over a collection, sending on one row at a time to the SQL Server, rather than sending a table value parameter or XML. So rewrite one by one processing, processing into set base also shortens the deadlock window. Or you might you find that you have two processes in the clash, but Wait a minute, they should not be running at the same time. That doesn't, doesn't make, even make sense. So just reschedule them to run at a different time. And generally, just be open-minded and think what you can do differently, not only in technical terms of technical things, but also maybe how the application works in general. Maybe, okay, if we're doing this process, maybe we should keep users out doing this process rather than having lots of deadlines. Application logs, finally. This is, let's say you have an operation, and which is, Absolutely, it makes no sense to run this in parallel because if you would do, they would just stomp on each other like this. Get, you would get deadlocks or locks or, or all sorts of is, issues. So you know, I only want to run one of these at the time. And application locks are great for these. So you can say, exit, get app lock, resource, give it the name, a lock mode exclusive. Now, as I said, it's a name, my lock. It can be Gretchen, it can be New York. Most of the time, I use the name of the supersedia where I have this. And it will block until that lock becomes available. By the way, yes, that lock is also local to the database, I should say. Um, and the lock is being held to the uh, sorry, yeah, the lock is being held at the end of the transaction. So it will all resolve automatically. But I would like to warn you though that don't use this for occasional deadlocks. Let's say you have an order entry process. Oh, every third week you get a deadlock. Oh, this is nasty. Well, oh, let's use application lock to serialize things. And yeah, your process is now going to grind to a standstill because of this because sometimes you want parallel execution. So this is only where you absolutely don't want parallel execution at all. Now, we have looked at a couple of ways to prevent deadlocks, but sometimes it is 
not, it's not uncommon, that is not possible to entirely prevent the deadlock or desirable because the ways to do that would cause more problems. But we can mitigate the deadlock in various ways so it doesn't cause, cause that much pain. And there are three ways to do that. So first of all, is deadlock priority. So let's say this, you have a common deadlock with a background process and end users. And end users will typically be the deadlock victim because they have less of log records. However, you think that it would, be, would be a lot better if the background process is the deadlock victim because, hey, it can come back later and, and try again. There's some automatic retry that is going on there. Oh, well, so the background process, what it would do then is set deadlock priority low, which means, hey, if there is a deadlock, I volunteer to be the victim. And rather than low, you can say high, normal, or a number from minus 10 to 10, and low is not the same thing as minus 5. But I have never had use for anything but low. I, I would absolutely do not use high. It's only going to cause you problems. Um, you can actually see the deadlock priority in the deadlock XML, <laughs> actually in two different places. There's task priority and there's priority. Now, it's priority is the one you should look at. But it says here minus 5 for low, and this one has the whole same thing, but with reverse sign. Please don't ask why. Now, move over to retries on deadlock. So rather than just saying, okay, we had a deadlock, we give up and quit. I mean, since it's a concurrence error, we could reattempt, and maybe next time we will succeed. That's actually quite likely. Now, some people say we should always retry on deadlock. That is best practice. You should always do this. I disagree. I say only implement deadlock retry when you actually have a problem with deadlock and you can't resolve them in another way. Why? Because if you implement that deadlock retry in the wrong way, that can lead to data errors that are very, very difficult to explain because they will only occur when you actually have a deadlock. And I will give an example of this later on. Also, I'd like to point out that testing deadlock retry is difficult because you need a deadlock to test. And you don't write code so it can produce deadlock, do you? And even if you have a situation where your deadlocks are a real problem, now producing that deadlock at will can still be difficult to do to do the testing. And it also might depend on where exactly the deadlock occurs if you get a problem or not. So I'd like to give you two key rules for implementing deadlock retries, because every once in a while you will need to do this, but only if there is a real problem. But there's two key rules. First of all, never redo only part of a transaction. And the corollary of this is never do a deadlock retry when you're called inside a transaction. Because if you get a deadlock, you must roll back the entire transaction. You cannot only roll back your part. You have to roll back the full transaction. So let's say this. You're writing a procedure that is going to perform a deposit or withdrawal on a bank account. And someone has told you, always implement deadlock retries, so you do that and you have a trust. So in, in that procedure, you're going to update, well, the transactions table, the cash holdings, and maybe a few more tables. And as I said, you have implemented deadlock retry. Now, another procedure that is supposed to perform a transfer from between two accounts is going to call you twice, first for the, the withdrawal and then for the deposit. And during the deposit, you get a deadlock and, oh, 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 I'm going to retry. And you redo only the deposit. So the account holder gets money out of nowhere. Oh, boom. Do you think the bank is going to like that? I don't think so. Or also, don't redo a committed transaction because then you can also get double things. So let's say that in your procedure, in this procedure, you have after the commit, there is a select that returns data to the client. And that select, for some reason, could deadlock. So let's say now the account holder goes to the ATM, withdraws money, and your select statement there deadlocks, and oh, I'm going to retry this. And the money is being withdrawn twice. Now, you really need to hope here that the account owner is not able to get hold of your address, because in that case, it could get really nasty. And I'll also like to point out that these errors will occur very occasionally and therefore can be very, very difficult to troubleshoot because they will not occur daily. All of a sudden, well, what happened here? Why, why, why not? You might not even think about, oh, there, there, yeah, there was a deadlock. Maybe that was the reason. It just it will just be a mystery to you. Now. All, it's also discussed a little bit about where to implement a deadlock retry. So inside us to proceed, well, sometimes that is what you have to do. But I like to point out that, except to the other, other reason I have already discussed, I also like to point out that it can clutter the code quite a bit, so much that you, well, you can't really see the business logic forest because there's so many deadlock retry trees in front of it, which also means that the risk for, del 
the bugs in the business logic are easy to achieve because you can't really see them because it's, the code is so cluttered. So maybe then you say, oh, but I can do a generic to try in the data layer. I guess it's one single place where we call all procedures. Yeah, but wait a minute. What if that procedure runs multiple transactions? Let's, so let's say that there is a procedure that accepts a TPP with uh, withdrawals to perform. And these are being run in the loop with one transaction each because some of these could fail because, well, lack of funds or whatever. And on the fourth one, there is a deadlock and the generic data layers resends the call and the first three deposits are being performed twice. Now, this can be dealt with with very good coding guidelines. Maybe that procedure should check out. Oh, maybe we have, we have already done this, but it takes quite a bit of code review, quite good developers to understand to get this working. Then we have the business layer. In a way, that is maybe the simplest thing. Sometimes this can also lead to code clutter, well, quite often. However, let's say you have a background process. Okay, let's it crash and it's going to be rescheduled to start with one, one minute. Not a problem. Or, well, if it's a UI, well, let's just clear everything, display the UI for the user, and say, yeah, try again. Uh, it's maybe not the prettiest, but at least it's safer. Now, for a longer discussion or a further discussion on deadlock retrieve, uh, on my website, I got a very long art or a series of articles around transaction handling in SQL Server. And section 4.4 .4 in part 3 discusses exactly deadlock retries and includes an example of a deadlock retry in the procedure so you can see example of the code clutter. Now, the last way to mitigate deadlock is lock terrans. So I've already said this, that the background process can well, implement deadlock priority low and also implement a good retry to mitigate the deadlock, which is quite great because it saves more important processes from being deadlock victims. But there can still be a problem because they're being held up for five seconds and that can be bad enough. You have a user entering data like this and all of a sudden, all of a sudden the system freezes. That drives me mad. Or if you have an order entry process and you get reduced throughput. So what if that background process could step out of the clash at an early stage before we get to deadlock? And it's possible to do this with the command set lock timeout. For example, saying 100. This means that, okay, if there is a lock, I'm going to wait for 100 milliseconds to get that lock. And if that timeout expires, I will get error 1222, lock request timeout period exceeded. And if I do that, well, I would go back, wait a short while, and then I would do a retry. This is not always the right thing to do because maybe that lock was not the start of a deadlock. Maybe it was just a normal blocking and it wouldn't have resolved. So this could result in the background process never getting things done, but it could be worth doing um, sometimes. I um, um, <clears throat> should say also that there are some variations. I can say set lock time at zero, which means don't wait at all. And I can say minus one, which means that's the normal thing, waits forever. And you can also see the lock time out actually, uh, the lock time out is also available in the deadlock XML. So we're coming towards the end of this session, but I like to do a summary of the most important things I've I've raised in this session. So keep this in mind, the occasional deadlock is absolutely no cause for alarm. It's when you get lots of them or you actually get real problems like users being irritated, etc. That's when you need to deal with them. And with analyzing the deadlock XML, first of all, is any process running in a multi sleep transaction? And last trend started, last batch started. Is the application running a multi batch transaction? Very important. And these exchange event elements in the resource list, well, yeah, if you see these, just ignore them. They're not going to help you a lot. And keep in mind, the faster the operations are, the smaller the window where the deadlock can occur. That's a very important thing. Now, one thing I haven't touched at, but I should, there's no denial. Well, I touched it. Oh, I actually did explain that one or two deadlocks for you, and you might have understood. Understanding exactly why you get a deadlock in full detail, with all the locks, etc., can be hard. You need to understand locking, you might have to look at query plans, you might, yeah, lots of stuff to actually understand why you get the deadlock. There's no denial about that. But there are some good news because you only need to understand as much so that you can make a decision on prevention or mitigation. And I've shown you quite a few examples of these. It's last attention after last trans started. Oh, go and troubleshoot that unhandled timeout. That's the thing to do. If you see page and table locks, well, go and apply query and index tuning before you do anything else. Read committed snapshot, great way to, to isolate readers and writers so you don't get, the, get those deadlocks. And use deadlock priority plus deadlock retry to mitigate the deadlocks involving background processes. And also, when things shouldn't run in parallel, 
well, either serialize them with, with application logs or make schedule them at different times. Just a few examples. And the last thing I'd like to point out. Often, when you have a dead lock, there's more than one way to go to prevent or mitigate it. And when you make this choice, choose wisely. Choose wisely. Why? Because if you make a bad choice, the cure can be worse than the disease. And I've given you some examples. For example, using the no-lock hint or incorrect date, uh, deadlock reply, you get spurious date errors that are very, very difficult to, um, to understand. Or if you serialize when you shouldn't do that, you're reducing the throughput of the system. And the list goes on. About any method I've shown you here, apply in the wrong place can give you worse problems than the deadlocks. So you need to take a holistic view of the situation. So I'd like to give a thanks to Microsoft for supporting the Data Platform Geeks and the Consumer Geeks and the community, community initiatives and making this event possible. Big thanks to Microsoft. And I'd like to thank you for attending this session. I'd like to remind you there are three ways to win prizes. You can post your selfie with a hashtag. You can visit the sponsors and exhibitors. And you can give session and conference feedback. And that is very important for me, particularly the session feedback. i like to know, did you like it? What could I do better, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, well, just to remind you, or repeat from what I said in the beginning, uh, my name is Alan Somasco. You get in touch with me. You're more than welcome to drop me a line at SQL, somasco.se, and you find slides and scripts for this session, somasco.se slash present. Thank you again for listening to this session. Mm -hmm.